name is Michael Blake. I am Professor of Philosophy, Public Policy, and Governance at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I'm the director of the program on values in society. My work tends to focus on international justice with a recent emphasis on migration and how norms of liberal justice do or do not constrain what states are allowed to do, both in their foreign policy and in their migration policy. That is, unfortunately, a fairly difficult question. Uh, and yet, at the heart of it, I think there's also a simple question. And the simple question is, are there limits to the state's rights to exclude non-members? And, and the answer is, there have to be. One of the touchstones, I think, of modern political philosophy is that if anything is wrong, declaring those who are not our kind as less than fully human is always a presumptively wrongful thing to do. You have to be able to guarantee that what you do is justifiable to people taken as, to use the old Rawlsian language, self-authenticating sources of valid claims, or more broadly, morally important. So then the only question is what kinds of situations give people a right to enter into a different jurisdiction and settle there? And there, I think the philosopher has only a limited role to play. It's possible for us to make some sense of what kinds of things we are entitled to as humans, what sorts of political institutions are rightful and what sorts are, are not, and thereafter to give some grounding to the thought that people who are suffering under wrongful forms of governance and wrongful forms of social relationships have a right to enter into places in which their rights are respected. The, I, I think one of the most simple formulations of this that's still very appealing is Hannah Arendt's the right to have rights, the thought that everyone is entitled to be in a context in which the institutions that govern them take them seriously as individuals. So at this point, I think if you say that that is almost the settled moral case, that there are some forms of atrocity that give one a right to cross borders, the questions that happen afterwards are the ones that get more difficult, and those are the questions of what exactly are the limits of refugee status? What do you have to show for something to be um, a ground of a valid refugee claim? And then, more broadly, how do we actually allocate the burdens, if that's the right way to think of them, of dealing with refugee flows? And all of these are questions that are going to become increasingly important. But the basic task that I'm, I think, better suited to dealing with is articulating the grounds and the limits of the principle that one is right to have a policy of exclusion and to demonstrate what is morally impermissible in exclusion, broadly understood. The first question might be to ask, is the right way to think of this a case of simple distribution of a burden? Because there's a sense in which that portrays the refugees from Syria as being akin to enormous babies. And you have to figure out who's going to pay for their diapers and who's going to provide them food. When in fact, of course, this is often a very, very inadequate way of describing what happens in the case of integration of people from abroad into a, a new society. They bring with them burdens, yes, but also enormous benefits, and the ways in which the economies do or do not integrate them can make the difference as to whether they are burdens, quote unquote, or, or not. But let's stick with a simple metaphor, because in fact, I think the question persists e whether or not we're willing to um, re-describe them. What is it that creates the obligation to care, to give some degree of time and attention and, for that matter, a jurisdictional home for people who are fleeing atrocity. And here, the broader question is, are there some forms of principle of distributive justice that can actually say we're doing it badly? And the simple response I can offer is, there have to be. And I'm not actually sure that you need a philosopher to tell you that. Um, one of the things that's increasingly clear is that philosophers are very good at hard questions. They're not very good at getting people to live up to the obvious answers to easy questions. In fact, the thought that we can keep out someone who is facing uh, atrocity, death, or for that matter, simple op oppression of a grand scale in their home country, that we can say, I'm sorry, we simply don't want you here. We like what we have. You can give a moral story as to why that's illegitimate, but in a sense, after 1945, very few of us are going to say that in the abstract, it's perfectly fine for me to prefer my comfort to your existence. 
So the question is, do we have an obligation to give some proportionate share of what we have so as to prevent atrocity? And the answer surely has to be, of course. And we can also say that the simple facts of geography, that bordering countries have historically borne a vastly disproportionate share of, of migrant populations, of fleeing the, the atrocities, that surely if distributive justice works anywhere, it works here. There is a simple accident of geography and history that's creating a vastly different set of constraints. And that given that all parties have some moral obligation to care and to be part of the solution to this morally pressing difficulty, you don't really need to write very much to explain why distributive justice does have something to say. Um, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be written. It just means that, in a sense, if you weren't convinced before the argument, you're likely not going to be convinced after either. You're committed to it's not working. The more interesting question to me, and the one that I'm actually extremely unsure I can help with, is whether or not the existence of the European Union creates differential obligations on the part of different countries. And my intuitive answer, as someone who doesn't live in the EU and, quite frankly, finds it enormously confusing as to how to understand the nature of it as an entity, is to say it, it seems difficult for us to imagine that an entity that has the jurisdictional role that the EU does, that presumes the right to actually pass binding legislation backed up in the limit case by force against member states and individuals within those states, that it doesn't have at its heart a commitment to the idea of some kinds of sharing and mutual support that wouldn't create special obligations to avoid using one's geography to immunize oneself from the obligations. That's a very fancy way of saying, if the EU has what I think it does, which is a sense of commonality, both of law and of purpose, then to say, we're all the way over here and the migrants are all the way over there, you lot take care of this, seems to do violence to the very purposes, but also to the prerequisites for success of Europe as a project. On my view, you have a right to first-class citizenship somewhere. You don't necessarily have the right to pick the place in which you'll have first-class citizenship, unless you are, in fact, simply asserting that borders ought to be open full stop, which some people do, but I don't. Um, so in other words, I can't wake up as a perfectly happy Canadian and decide that, you know, I quite like Durham. Today I feel British, and Britain must accept me. In fact, Britain might say, I don't particularly care. Whatever the concept of the refugee entails, it doesn't entail middle-aged professors who just wake up and feel British. So surely there is not a right to choose one's own idealized country. But neither, I think, do we in the long term create societies that are going to flourish if people are assigned to places in which they feel fundamentally ill at ease. So a different sense of should that argues that we don't actually have a moral duty. If let's say everyone who enters Europe says, you know what, we all want to go to London. We've heard nothing but good things. And they all say, we all want to go to London. We certainly don't have an obligation to say, well, that settles it, doesn't it? Everyone gets to move to London. And the simple fact is, we have an obligation to take care of your rights, but they don't include that. But to say that there will be a central hierarchical allocation of people to places is to create a recipe for a society of people who are fundamentally hostile to the very places and societies in which they are found. And it's, I've always thought that the virtue of stability, which Rawls identifies as a key virtue, it gets ignored simply because it is the least interesting word one could imagine. Stability, that's dull. In contrast, though, I think the absence of stability is exciting for all the wrong reasons. If you have a society of people who are hostile and alienated, even if they play the game, their children won't. It's difficult for us to create societies made up of people who simply don't care about the identity, the history, and the people around them. We have to be careful before we use that to exclude people, but we ought also to be careful because it's a true fact before we ignore this in figuring out who goes where. So again, this is one of the cases where I'm quite grilled out I'm a philosopher and not a politician, because I know what the pitfalls are, but I don't know what the idealized answer ought to be. Well, I think there are two answers, depending again on how 
we interpret the question. The first, the easiest one, is to say, oh, God, no. Of course not. Um, if moral corruption and hypocrisy is a risk, then how could you avoid it if you said, well, we're willing to take the refugees, but they have to be white, and we'd like Protestants, thank you very much. That makes it entirely too easy to pick and choose, but the point about refugee status is it's not about you, it's about them. It's about rescuing people whose very lives are at stake, and the thought that you're allowed to preserve your own idiosyncratic preferences as superior to those rights to survival, um, it, it seems like a moral non-starter. So sometimes when the argument you've said is used, it's used in a way that I think is frankly quite malicious. It's designed to simply say, we're willing in theory to accept the burdens, but not the ones that are actually out there. But there's a second way of asking this question, which is, can there be any legitimate forms of preference once we've ensured that everyone is in fact being taken care of? If you imagine the following, all the countries of the world that have the capacity to accept and integrate refugees get together and they figure out who's going to take who. And in fact, the guiding principle is that all of the refugees will be taken care of. No one's using this as an excuse to shirk the work. Um, and imagine then that we say perhaps religion and culture or even ethnicity are bases for uh, solidarity that could be useful here. Under those circumstances, it seems like potentially this is permissible. It's just that those aren't our circumstances. Um, and there's also a second problem on, on my view, which is that sometimes there's a problem with domestic legitimacy that comes from declaring that some forms of identity are simply better than others. Even if you don't get to the question of whether it's right to prefer Christians to Muslims among the population of refugees, it, to my mind, is a radically illegitimate domestic act to have as an official statement of government policy, Christians are better than Muslims. It's simply in virtue of the fact that this can't help but be experienced by Muslim citizens as being a way of saying, we really wish you didn't exist. And if there's anything that's illegitimate in a domestic uh, system of government, saying to your own citizens, the future would be better without you in it, seems to be an example. So to actually say, around here we like this type of person, even if you weren't saying it in a malicious way, it's almost always a way of saying, we wish we didn't have this kind of person. And for any existing society, you do have that kind of person, and you have obligation to treat them as equals in the process of governance, and that seems to be something that, as a statement, is not something you're able to make. The two thoughts that I have are this. One of them is that I've been worried my whole academic life about the justification of violence, because to me, a lot of what states do is violent. They insist upon compliance, and they don't praise their requests as simple requests, they are backed with threat. And that means that you have a special obligation to be careful in whether or not the threats you issue are justifiable. Now, it seems to me that one way of discussing safe passage is that we're implicitly or explicitly mandating violence that would be used as a way of preventing people from reaching things to which they are entitled. You say that the migrants in question are in fact entitled to protection, and if not to protection, to at least a, a hearing as to whether or not they are entitled to protection, then we're in a position of using violence to prevent people from attaining their rights. And that makes me think that even if it is enormously convenient for us to use policies that are designed to reduce the flow of migration of, in, in this character, I think we are morally on the wrong side. The countervailing consideration for me is that I think there is, as blunt and unsophisticated as it sounds, there are negative and positive rights of migration. So for instance, I think people fleeing poverty have a right, which they don't currently legally have, to enter into a society in which they are able to obtain some minimal standard of preservation of, of their interests in their lives. And I don't know if that requires us to actually create a positive program. Let's imagine a, a boat lift or a series of airplanes flown down to these places so as to provide them not only with the legal right, but with the means to actually make use of it. So in fact, there is a distinction that we might not be able to exclude people, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to help them 
to us make maximal use of their rights. This, of course, is kind of perverse because it means that the people who migrate are never the poorest of the poor. They're the relatively well-off among the poor who are able to actually exert the kind of planning influence of their lives that enable them to make journeys, whereas those who are the most deeply oppressed are simply interested in surviving until tomorrow. So if you rely on that, then you could say, we do not have the right to exclude, but neither do we have any obligation to maximize the number of people who prevent them, present themselves rather as claimants for our assistance. So I recognize that these are both, to me at least, considerations that sound plausible, and I don't know which way to go. So the simple answer is, I think there are some things that we obviously do that are malicious and wrong, and some of the ways in which we prevent people from arriving at circumstances in which their cases will be adjudicated have the indicia of ordinary forms of cruelty that seem to mark them out as morally obviously wrongful. But the broader moral question of whether we are ever permitted to minimize the number of people who are able to make use of their legal and moral rights to refuge, that moral question is one that I still haven't figured out an answer to. I think there's often an enormous divide between how philosophers speak of things and how people who aren't philosophers speak of things. And that gap is rarely a good thing, either for philosophers or non-philosophers. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to be into an area in which increasingly the questions are not how justice in migration ought to be lived, but how effectively to speak back against the worst forms of evil that are going to be reintroduced. And for better or for worse, I worry that a lot of what I do might be useful in other contexts. And increasingly, it's not clear to me how useful it's going to be. I think we're entering into an area in which we're going to have people no longer ashamed to say things that perhaps even 10 years ago would have been met with widespread condemnation in public. And it's useful for philosophers and academics to keep the light on to our better ideals of the treatment of human a humans as moral equals. But it's also useful, I think, for us to recognize that we have to also stop being philosophers sometimes and simply find out how to reiterate the continuing moral importance of people, which isn't a topic that philosophers necessarily spend a lot of time on because it's where we start. And in contrast, I think increasingly we're going to have people who are willing to simply question the very humanity of the foreign human. For better or for worse, this is a world that's going to get very interesting in all the ways that I wish it wasn't.